Ms Limbo, welcome to today's studio. And welcome to London. First question, it's a big question. One of the things that I came across the most when I was researching you and reading about your work is the word timeless. People use it all the time when they're describing your pictures. And I wonder, what do you think gives them that quality? Timeless is a very high seen quality. I don't know if it really is this, because I mean, either you can go into details and you can start decorating your pictures and decorating the people you photograph. And um, so that is not timeless, I think, because all the decoration is going to look, I mean, old in 10 years or 15 years. And if you strip everything away and um, do minimalist approach to every portrait you do, so then it's very difficult. To, then you are automatically timeless, I think. Mm. And do you think that that desire to strip everything away relates to your idea of beauty? I wonder, how do you see beauty? I have a very simple definition for beauty. I mean, the, 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 the lowest you can get, no? you can have. And that is um, yourself. It gets just about yourself. If you stand to yourself and you, I mean, you, you be yourself, then you're beautiful. Mm. It sounds very, very a little cheap, but it is, I think there's no other definition, except you can go into details again, no? but I mean, if you want to go as basic as possible, mm. as basic, then I think that's a pretty okay one. One thing that's so interesting about your work, though, is because stripping away those elements of artifice, whether it's clothing or the expensive handbag or the makeup, yet still having a woman who looks so beautiful. In a way, for you know, the reader of the magazine who might encounter that work, it's almost harder to achieve because it's natural beauty. They've got nothing they can rely on. And I find that quite interesting. It's like, it's real, but somehow it's even more difficult to achieve. Do you think about that when you're taking pictures? You know, people always ask me today, so has, has your ideal of beauty, has that changed um, since the eight, end of 80s, the 88, when we did the first picture with, the, with this later called supermodels um, in the white shirts? And it didn't, I have to say. I mean, it's really, I have that same idea and that same vision. The people look a little different, the women look different by themselves today, but I mean, not from my point of view shooting them, mm. and nothing has changed, the less as possible. And, and that was a very big, um, it was a very big fuss in the, in the Photoshop years, when Photoshop came up, and then you could see that people doesn't have a conviction or an, an idea, because then Photoshop comes up suddenly, and before it was too complicated to massacre the woman in Photoshop, so then you just, um, leave them alone, and when Photoshop was there, suddenly people started to stretch and do this kind of thing and, 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 and really destroyed them or took everything out of them. I mean, everything what a person um, could have learned or, or any traces of life, they're going to retouch all of your face, you know, just because there's a guy now who can do that very easy, you know? mm. and often it's not the photographer, it's probably in the magazine, and that's something which is really, that should not have happened. Do you see your work as being political in the fact that it takes issue with that artifice? I understand the question's very, very, I mean, it's not very, I, the sound is not very good. Uh, Either you, you speak louder or I listen better. <laughs> I'll speak louder. Do you see your work as being political? Yes and no. I don't want to, I mean, blow myself up into a political photographer, but I mean, it was a political decision in 88, for example, uh, not to go with that image of the woman in the fashion, ma fashion magazines at this time. And, and that was kind of the idea to look somewhere else and what later had become the supermodels. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that um, in the 80s and before, women, they lived more through their, um, the definition was more done by what she was wearing, where she was living. I remember when I did the, my first collection, American collection for American Vogue, I went, I just took everyone and said, oh no, we go downtown Soho. <laughs> and people said, 
what, you can't go to Soho, Vogue is uptown, no? Uh, so that was the kind of woman, and my ideal woman was the girls in art school. No? Mm. They had like t-shirts on or, or, or jeans and, and, and tennis shoes, and they were there for a reason, no? Mm. They're not just running around showing their handbags, they were just there because they wanted to do something, no? And that kind of a woman, that has been really marked me deeply, and I think I have the same, the same idea today that this is the woman I liked. And when I started to do that, I remember I saw Mr. Lieberman call me in his office because he was frustrated because I always said no to American Vogue. And he said, what is happening? Why not just tell me that you not want to work for us. You know who we are. And I said, yes, I know, yes, I know. But um, he said, what is the reason? I, said, I, can't, I can't photograph this kind of woman. Mm. It's just impossible. I'm totally demotivated, I'm not inspired. Mm. And, and then he was like looking at me like, yes, yes, young man. And he said, um, why don't you go somewhere, wherever you want to go, and take an editor, any editor you like from us, and then you come back with the woman you like and show it to us, no? Mm. And I did it. I went to Los Angeles with like uh, Christy, Tatiana, Linda already, and Karen Alexander and, and the six girls and I shot them in a quite different way, just in white shirts, because I, I didn't get it right, because I was thinking they want me just to show them like a casting picture. Mm -hmm. and, and they were imagining a, a fashion story, just a little bit different hairstyle, I think, so not so much. Now, when I came back with the pictures, they looked at me, they looked at each other, and they said, um, what shall we do with this? And I said, I don't know, you asked me to bring pictures to you for the woman I like, that is the woman I like. And then he said like, okay, thank you very much. And then <laughs> see you next time in 100 years or something. And um, that was it. And then a little later, Anna Winter came to Vogue, like not even six months later. And in the meantime, uh, the editor who was in charge then had to change his job. And, and Anna saw the pictures and said, you know, I would have given you the cover and 20 pages. Mm. So it was just six months too early. Mm. And it's interesting because I suppose that's the line between old and new. And people lost their jobs. And people had to adapt to a new, a new way of thinking. Because as you say, before it was much more the handbag and the makeup and much more formal. Yeah, you, you, ex you, I mean, you, you, you existed through your background in a way, no? Mm. Mm. And that I thought was not a nice way to see things. Mm. And would you say that it changed your perception of Vogue? Because you, you said to me before that you couldn't stand the kind of woman who was featured in that magazine and the idea of the rich husband. And I wonder why you almost wanted to work for Vogue in the first place. They wanted me to work <laughs> for them. <laughs> so they asked, they came to the current service, they came and they said, oh, we like your pictures, you want to work for us? And I said, yeah, yeah. And then I looked at the man and they said, wow, that's, I have nothing to do with this, I can't. And it was not like snobbish or something. It was just, you know, when you're a photographer and you're not inspired by what you photograph, that then you can't. It's going to be terrible, no? Mm. And useless. And so I thought, that's, you're not going to do that, no? And I didn't. <laughs> Let's go back and talk about further back right. back back to when you were small and talk to me about growing up because you said that you grew up in the most depressing part of Germany and tell me about about what you were like as a boy what you were interested in oh that not uh, not really there's not much to say because we, we grow I grew up in a very little industrial town in the Ruhr in Germany which is like uh, do you have something like this in England too I think but I've really got the big 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 factories and and, and nothing else no Everything is grey, and um, I was only interested in one thing, and this was to play to handball. I was in a handball crew, and a very good one, and I was a great guardian, a goalkeeper, say, you know? And that was the only thing I was interested in, and I had no idea that culture existed, no painting existed, I mean nothing. I didn't know where Africa was, I've never seen a black person. Uh, I mean really kind of focused, no? I mean, focused on nothing in a way, you know? And um, that's how I grew up. And the culture in our house was, when I, my brother and my sister, they don't like it when I say that, but there was, our culture department was like, 
a piece of wood this long and with big heavy Bertelsmann books, you do an abonnement, you, you, you subscription, and they bring you four books, you don't know which books they're just coming, they're this big, and they put, you put them on the, on the shell, and so the shell has a little look like this, and that was on the wall, and never ever touched, nobody ever touched them. That was our cultural representation, and but that was everything. But were you happy? Because I guess you didn't know any different. Yeah, yeah. We, we had nothing. No? We had really nothing, but there was nothing missing at all. No? So that's a good situation. Mm. Today, more you have everything, and you're not happy because you want more. And that was just the opposite of that. And talk to me about moving to Berlin, because Berlin obviously had a big impact on you. You mentioned those girls before and how they dressed, and you know, the t-shirts and the tennis shoes. And yeah, was that, that something of a visual awakening? To go to Berlin, that's another hour from now. Do we have the time? <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> no, it's, um, Berlin was, I, 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 when I had to go to the military service. I knew one thing, I was not political and not, not um, um, an activist or something. I mean, not at all an activist. And I had to go to the military service. You know? And that was, I know, I didn't want to do. You know? And so I went to Switzerland. And I was a window dresser. In the meantime, I became a window dresser in a big department store. And then I went to Switzerland. And in Switzerland, uh, that was not the right place if you're 18 um, either. So from Switzerland, after eight months, I went to Berlin. Mm -hmm. And that's when everything started. No? Mm. Do you think your time working in the department store has influenced you? Because you must have become aware of commerce and fashion. And I hope not. No, I hope not. <laughs> 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 People always say that you don't like fashion when they write about you, but no, does no, that get tiring? No, 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 it's not, because they, they, they always say, well, you hate fashion, you don't like fashion. It's not true. I like fashion, but fashion is, has no role in my pictures. I mean, it has, because they're not nude, no? but not more than that. I'm happy when I have a fashion that doesn't disturb me in the story I want to tell, for example, if it's a narrative. No? And then sometimes you do couture, and then it's all about the fashion, no? But mm. in, the, in the real, like normal life and the normal pictures I do, fashion is um, second, no? More so important is the story, and then the fashion goes with the story, I'm happy. Why, why place your pictures in a fashion magazine then? Well, they asked me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you once you said to me when I interviewed you before you talked about circus uniforms and this idea of never wanting to make the person in front of you look sort of unlike themselves even if it was the new collection and I guess does it always come back to just stripping away and that you feel that to shoot fashion you're adding on yeah yeah I think that I, I have no really interest in showing the changing collections and all that. So that's a very, very different departure. Depart, a different departure. And I didn't go, that's hard to believe, I didn't go to a fashion show in 20 years. And that was not because I hate the fashion, that was because I just didn't want to get inspired from the fashion, because everybody else get inspired from the fashion. And and then somebody done a khaki collection, or the, the five designers do a khaki collection. So they get like 100 phone calls from all the magazines. Oh, wow, we want to go to, to the Sahara, and we do like a great story there. So that is not, the, and, and, and then you, you get like beaten, every season you get like beaten around, now is this, now you do this, now you do this. And if you work on your own terms and on your own inspiration, then you, I live on a different planet, no? I see everything, but not so much either, but you're on your own, your own tempo, on your own subjects and your own things, and that is a very nice way to work, you know, you're always somewhere else, no? <laughs> what was the first fashion show that you did go to? Uh, that I really don't remember, see? I don't know, no, I was just would say something, now to not look stupid, but that would be not true, so. But do you remember ever being moved or inspired by a designer's work? Like the first time you shot a Comme des Garçons collection? 
Comme le garçon, I remember when Ray, when Ray came to, to, to Europe, I had to come to a hotel where they were, and there were like a lot of little Japanese women all dressed in black, and, and one of them came to me and said something like, Han second time I'm in Japanese, and the, 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 the woman beside translated that in, in, in English, and she said, you are the fa her favorite photographer, and she wants you to do uh, the Im her image for the company, no? And that was very funny because I, I, well, I said, I want more information. I said, what, what is it you, you want to do? And she said, no, no, you, no? <laughs> and uh, no, it, it didn't give me any information. And I wasn't thinking that that's going to be a big brand or something. It was just interesting. Mm. And, and then they said, can we show you the clothes? And that was a moment when, when the clothes were kind of variable, which is like uh, probably an insult or not, I don't know. But it's, I saw the clothes on the hangers and I was like, I mean flabbergasted. I was am amazed, I've never seen anything like it, no? Mm. There was like, like, like jackets with like that kind of, you know, Joseph Boyce, no? The material he works with, all, what, what do you call that in English? A very sick, sick material. They were like, an evening, short mini evening dress, mm. like from with sky, you know, the horrible handbags from the airlines were in the 60s, and, and, and made from this, and really amazing things. Mm. And that was very inspiring. And then I said, if nobody gives me any indication, I really do what I want. And I went to my hometown, to this area there, and, and shot the, them in factories. And, um, that had no relation to anything, except that was what I wanted to do. Mm. And um, that's how Comte de Gasson started, no? Mm. And that was very exciting. So you can, you can be moved by fashion. Maybe it's just that you think that most fashion is mediocre. No, no. Really, I have nothing against fashion. No, I have nothing against fashion at all. It's really only that is not my, my point. When I do a story, then then I, I have a story in my mind, and then when I work for American work, for example, for Anna, then they really got strict with the collections. So you do different stories. You, you do stories where they fit, no? Mm. And, and they're in color, too, for Anna, because black and white she doesn't like so much. Mm. And, then, and then if it's Italian work, for example, you do something totally different, where you get away with not being on the point of the fashion in the moment, no? Mm. And, and because Frank was an editor who really went for photography, mm -hmm. photography, and that was really comfortable and you could really do whatever you like. And it's still considered fashion photography because there was a, di a discussion I had with Grace, my old friend for like ever, no? For 30 years. And, and Grace has been asked in a film they did from one of my exhibitions, they did an interview with Grace and Grace, they asked her, and said, so great, Grace, what is fashion photography for you? What, what should fashion photography do? And Grace said, fashion photography first has to show the clothes. So, I mean, fine. <laughs> and, and, and then she said, and this can be in the way of art. That's fine too. And the case mostly. <laughs> and, and then, and then, after you can play, no? Mm. And, and, and I answered to her and I said, that is an insult because fashion photography, you have given the freedom to fashion photography to be much, much bigger than fashion mm. because otherwise it's a catalog photography, you know? If you mm. make that point that the fashion, the fashion photography is the most important thing, then, then, then you stop very fast. You mm. can go further, no? And I think, inspiring fashion photography is much more independent from fashion because fashion is also much more than fashion, no? I mean, much more than clothes. So what, what is the most important thing? Like what, what makes a great fashion image? Is it the person, the narrative, yeah, the I feel? Think you, you, define, you define a kind of woman in a certain time and, and I think that is as important or over, the, or over a period of time, it's more important than than helping the industry to sell clothes, which mm. is absolutely a great cause. But I mean, if you into photography, 
then that is not the first point. So do you ever find it hard to reconcile that belief with shooting an advertising campaign for a brand where the purpose of the image is simply to sell clothes? See, and even in the advertising, the, the, the people don't want you, they don't want catalog pictures, no? Mm. Just they want interpretations and they want to be things like that. That's what they want. Mm. And, and you would think the advertiser, you don't see a pocket, then they don't like the idea of, of that picture. But it's not like that. Mm. They're pretty free in, in advertising. Mm. Do you think if you were starting out today, you would be successful as a photographer? Oh, that's a great question. Um, of course I would. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what today, the problem today is, um, you know, everybody talks a lot about, about uh, um, digital, and everybody says digital is so, the quality was so great, the grain and everything. That's all ridiculous because you can do the image on the digital, you can reproduce 100% uh, uh, the quality and the feeling of a print, no? Mm. Or whatever film, you can even choose the film, no? And so that is totally no argument. The real danger of um, digital is that people shoot digital in the studios. I don't know if you have seen that, I don't know what Nick does, mm. but you have a screen in the studio. Yeah. And that is going to take the balls away from the photographers in the next 10 years that you don't have anybody after who can even decide what to do because everybody looks at the same time as, a, as that screen and photography cannot be democratic. And you don't have accidents either because you see something you don't like and you fix it immediately. So I imagine with a lot of your favorite images or your shoots, often it was a mistake or the, the weather changed or the light changed or the girl moved in a different way and you don't realize that you've captured something until later. Yeah, because these are people who have, uh, they, they just stay there and want to say something and say, oh, that's beautiful. And that's just, I mean, it's not beautiful. And that is really mind blowing because it cannot be democratic. How that, could that be democratic? Everybody talks into something and then I, I know that I'm not shooting something perfect in that moment, no? Mm -hmm. But for, for whatever the reason is, sometimes you continue and shoot on, on something which is really horrible mm. because it's on the way to become something and that needs time, that needs emotional approaching, everything like that. And then you have somebody in the middle, hey, it's a lag in the back, it's not really nice. That doesn't work, no? That doesn't work. That kills everything, no? And, and mm. it's, that comes to that point where the photographer is not somebody pushed the button. Mm. And that what I'm saying is like that the digital is responsibility is that in 10 years maybe the photographer who is the main person who has everything in mind, it can be the editor can say something to him of course, no? but not like everybody screams something because they see it at the same time on the screen. Mm. That's, I did want to campaign in, 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 um, in America and that was in the beginning of the digital and the art director said, you know, um, finally get me to shoot it digital, it was very interesting. And he said, and I look at the screen, in the, I have a tent beside, like with a long cable, and I sit there and watch you. And I said, no, 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 no. And he said, okay, I promise you, I'm not gonna say a word the whole day. And he didn't, no. And in the evening, when, when we were finished, he came out and said, God, I learned so much today. And what was this? He learned that, that when a photographer works with someone intimate, and things are not being nice in that moment, he just waits, no? Mm. And then if, he, if the screen would have been there, the, the architect would have said already after 10 seconds, that's not working or something. Mm. But then he said, and when I, I saw that, and I saw that 100 times a day, I thought, oh, what, why is that looking like this? And then 30 seconds after, it was fantastic. He mm. went to something. So all that movements and all these beautiful things, they disappear, no? And mm. they get, okay, you can shoot, no? You use the word intimate there, and I wonder, is that the success of a lot of your pictures? Do you think that relationship, that intimacy between you and the, the subject? Because you're very close to a lot of the girls that you shoot, yeah. you know, and they, they really adore you, and do you think that part of the beauty of your pictures is that intimacy? Yeah, and I, I, I could talk about the last 2017, that prevalent uh, Pirelli calendar, mm. how that came together. And that came together, I, I was talking to the Pirelli people, mm. to Tronchetti, the CEO, 
And, and he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to, do, I want to make a statement because I think the, the beauty and the photography, the beauty in photography and the photography itself has become something really, I, I just cannot sign up on this. Mm -hmm. And I want to do something, I want to show, I want to show what beauty is for me, which very mm -hmm. far away from Photoshop and very far away from decoration. Mm -hmm. and, and so I asked like uh, 12, 14 actresses, 14 actresses, I said, you want to be part of this? And they all said yes. So we had 14, which is difficult for 12 months. No? <laughs> and, uh, and then but, but the idea was really, really to show them that nobody knows them that way, you know? Really, really personal and intimate. And that shoot that took like 10 days or something, that was the most beautiful week in my life, you know? Mm -hmm. It was so, so beautiful. Everybody was ready to do that, you know? And everybody was, was convinced that's a beautiful thing to do. And then I wrote a little pamphlet um, about, about what beauty should be today and what beauty has become. And there's nothing bad about it, that the idea of beauty is going to be used for commercial interests. That's fine, no? Mm -hmm. But it's also good to show something which is what I think is more real beauty or a real beauty than, than just a kind of a architectural beauty with kind of some mm -hmm. products or something. No, it's very, very different. And when we shot that, the, the second one was Nicole Kidman, and, and Nicole and I we were sitting there, and Nicole said after 10 minutes, wow, you're really doing it, no? <laughs> <laughs> so, so funny. I said, what do you thought? What, what? I said, I didn't think that we were going to really do it. No? And she was, I mean, she looks fantastic. There's like nearly nothing on her, no? Mm. And she looks so interesting. And that was the same thing with all of them. Everybody was ready to, 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 to give the intimacy and, and to, to give the engagement to go, to go with this plan, no? Mm. And, and, when, and, and when these pictures happen, there's such a relationship. And I know them all for 20 years, no? And, um, and Nicole said in an interview, and she said, when they asked her, how is it possible that you look so different there? And she said, you know, there is such a friendship between us, no? And, and that is so powerful, she mm. said, no? And, and that was a base to go to the intimacy you could never have with someone you don't know, no? Mm. That fast. Mm. And that, for this, you have to let, let these two people alone, no? And um, that things can develop, no? And people, I guess, have to be able to relax with you. Like you told me once, and it really made me laugh, that you hated when they banned smoking because it was so great just to get someone to, t to have a cigarette <laughs> in front of you. <laughs> and you, and when you, you couldn't do that anymore in a photograph, and it was much harder to get the girls looking really relaxed. And it made me laugh a lot. But that is, it. so that's, is that the key for you, is to have them that's comfortable? Such a small detail, but it changed a lot. I feel like, like models are not, narrative, not used in narrative context, no? mm. so, and then either they pose or they don't pose. No? And if you give them a cigarette, then they're not posing because they're doing something. Mm. And when the cigarette ban came more or less, that we started to use little plastic espresso cups or something, <laughs> but just that they have to do something. So if you stay there in front of the camera, you have nothing to relate to, it's terrible. No? And if you have a cup of coffee or a cigarette, then you're not there for the picture. You can imagine you're just there. And that's a very, very different feeling. Mm, mm. <laughs> it goes back, I guess, because, so we, we kind of jumped ahead, but going back, you, you got into photography because you were taking pictures of your, your brother's kids. Yeah, and you do your homework. But I guess it's like you're always trying to replicate that energy that a child has where they're very unaware and it's very pure and they're not aware of the camera. You know, they're just being. That's very, very true, because that, when you have done, I mean, kind of a few pictures, well, only like a year or two, but it's so amazing how they, how they, they in front of the camera, because they have no consciousness at all mm. about themselves then. And that is beautiful, and that is still, I have to say, that's like 50 years ago, uh, that is still kind of a, a measure, a measurement for me. When I see that, I say, no, 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 it's not giving everything, there's something, I got a little massage. So that then goes away too. And, and that is beautiful because when you shoot with someone, like, like especially Pirelli, because that was all based on this idea, no? Um, when you shoot someone, um, that it is like 
And I learned that, I'll start differently. I learned that one time, everything I say, I learned. No, it's not that I read it, something somebody told me. So I get, one of my sons did a picture of me. I want even a passport picture, and I hate to be photographed. I'm really totally stiff and, and, and don't know what to do. And then I don't want to change my face like a little <laughs> smirk to look better, because I think that is stupid, no? And so then it doesn't help when you look better. And, and, and he shot me with the camera, just in the office a little bit, and I felt nothing of that, no? And I was told I had no camera. And that's because I love him. And that is like such an incredible, there was such an incredible difference. I was shocked. Mm. About only five minutes, a little situation. And, and that is what is happening, what, what I try to achieve when, when I work, I mean, my, my, for myself, when I work with somebody, you, in a way you disappear and the camera disappears. And then there is open, a kind of a space opens up between, and that's, that's just about portraits, like Pirelli or like pictures like that. And, and suddenly uh, there's a room who, who, who installs themselves and then in that room, that person you photograph steps in and gives you something. And then however you react, then you react to that and then think of you more and more. And, and it's like a, like, it's like a conversation or something. Mm. And, and that is so beautiful and it's so powerful that that space is able to transform someone. I mean, that sounds you know, really frightening, not mm. a bit Houdini, mm -hmm. but it is really, I mean, I have seen miracles, no? Because just there was somebody I really, really liked and I want to shoot him and then at the end, they looked exactly as I imagined them to look. And that is a way different from, different from, from the reality, you know, and that is like unbelievable. I mean, it's frightening, I have to say. So, do you see your photographs as collaborations then? Because if it's so much a conversation between you and the subject. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would, the last thing I would think is that I go there somewhere, go up with a big Peter Limburg and shoot someone, and that's him. Mm. No, that is not like that. And that is what most of the people probably think. Um, when you get out of your fancy Porsche, you walk in the studio, you feel like God. And then you, you shoot someone and you feel like mm, you did it again. Mm. Uh, no, it's very, very different. No? It really, it's a really, it's not even a collaboration. It's kind of like two, two gas going to come together. Really, it's very in, immaterial. It's not really materialistic. It's very kind of immaterial. Is that English? Mm. Yeah, no? mm. immaterial. It's a, a feeling, a very, very untouchable, the thing, but powerful. Mm. Do you, are there instances where you work with someone I mean it's a bit like trying to illustrate something you know sometimes where you just can't get their likeness and do you ever have that when you're shooting someone where you can't capture them you just feel like there's something about them that you're not I mean you can take a beautiful picture of them but it's not them yeah that's very rare it's very rare but it happens um, I worked with someone last uh, 10 days ago, um, a man I really like for what he is, but he's not very flexible in, photo in the photogenic. And he walked in, in, in LA, he walked in the room and he said, Peter, I have 45 minutes, like hurry up man. And, and I looked at him and I said, hmm. And I said, I need 12. And he said, what? I said, in 12 minutes, you're gone. And it took seven minutes at the end. And it was somebody who was a brilliant person, but not like, like a concrete block in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. It was Al Gore. No? Mm -hmm. We shot Al Gore for some reason. No? And that was like, when, when you see, you cannot, that was impenetrable. You could not go through them. And then you just do your job, you look fantastic, no? and you make a good light and shoot it, and then you can't go further and you go home. And do you, does it feel less satisfying? You know, because like when I interview people, I always think it's a good interview if I manage to get a real sense of the person, you know, something new. And is that how you approach photography? Like you want something that maybe people haven't seen before? 
Yeah, because there's, there's one thing. You, you people tend to think that this picture is exactly him or her. But that's ridiculous because a, a person is so complex no? and so deep and so many angles and, and things. Nobody can do one picture and show what that person is. That would be terrible, no? And, and so you just shoot. That is what I wanted to say before with that space. You shoot that moment mm. who appears in that space. That's what you shoot. And next day, at the same time, the same weather, the same everything, you shoot that same person and it's a different person, no? Mm. So that, that shows there is no that one person to shoot with one picture. That really doesn't exist. Mm. And we hope, thanks God, no? Mm. You very nearly didn't become a photographer, though. You were almost a painter, an artist. Talk to me about that, because that's a very different way of working. That's not a collaboration at all. That's you making work on your own. Yeah, that, that I figured out when I started with photography. I figured out that that is something very um, reflective, no? because there are people, you, you shoot someone, you were there, other people are there, so it's very reflective, and that's beautiful. And, um, I was in art school, so the discussion, photographers are artists or not. In mm. my case, it's absolutely not necessary. I'm an artist. Because <laughs> <laughs> I went to art school, that's normally the, the, the idea about it. <laughs> and um, um, when, no, um, I lost, that was a brilliant idea I wanted to tell you, and I just lost it. <laughs> it just went away, I went, went very deep and then it was gone. <laughs> It'll come back. You just missed something incredible, I can <laughs> tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you enjoyed that time? Did, was it a formative time working in that medium? The best time in everybody's life, I think, possible is art school. No? Because you have a place to go, you can do what you want, and you're not responsible for anything. Uh, that's fabulous, a pretty good point. So why did you move away from it? No, I thought you wanted to say, why did you stop the, the art school? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well kind of, but why, why did you stop making art and move into making pictures? Yeah, that was, um, I had a very good direction and I really was very, very proud of myself. I was very happy with myself. And then the one problem, and I did, I did that with, with Art Forum. We did a big story in Art Forum, so I repeat what I already said. And, and then I was really happy and I was really thinking, wow, that's all I learned about art. That is really great. Then suddenly the Americans walked in and that was the concept artists, like Kossuth no? and, and Weiner and, and Hübler, all these people. They walked into Europe no? and, and we looked really like provincial, Nothing, no? That was, um, they were so brilliant. The ideas were so brilliant. I remember the Kossuth, the first thing I saw from Joseph Kossuth mm -hmm. was, um, I think it's called chairs. No? So there's a chair, a physical chair standing there. Then there's a picture of a chair on the wall and the word chair, no? And I mean, I was just, I get goosebumps still today, no? When I think about that, that was a revelation. And I was thinking, my God, and you with your movable elements, come on, no? <laughs> and, and that made me just stop. And that was good, no? Because I, I, I felt the most important thing that is confirmed by the last 30 years is that you come to, to a point where you can really put, I mean, mix what you are in your work, you know? Because otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. And I figured out when I was still doing my stuff, the concept artists came and I wanted to do a, take a little bit from them, but still doing my work at the same time. And, and, that, and I felt that it goes like this, and that was not a good thing, no? Mm. And so, and even if it was brilliant what you're doing, but if you don't feel it's you, then mm. it doesn't make much sense. And then it will not go very far, no? because I think all the people who are really, really successful, the geniuses or whatever, they all had that access to themselves mm. where they took their, 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 their creati uh, creativity from. Mm. And that, when I, then I had like six months I hadn't done nothing. And then some friend of a friend, a photographer, was looking for an assistant. And my friend said, come on, you just sit around now for eight months. Come on, do something. You can always think when you work, which is absolutely true. 
<laughs> and, and so I became an assistant. I had no clue. I didn't even know what the flush was. No? <laughs> and in and, and like three months, I knew that is what I should do. No? Mm. And would you say that there are photographers who have influenced you? Because you say, you know, almost like you can't be influenced. You can't take something from someone else to be really, really good at what you do. It has to be completely you. But there must be pictures that have had a profound impact. Uh, the whole history from Piatesh to Penn and to every, I mean, Dynabus is always a very good uh, um, uh, measurement for things, no? Mm. The truthfulness of Dan Abus and all the American farm um, administration photographers, no? Who went through America during the Depression. I mean, all that, all this truthfulness, no? Mm. Is, I mean, striking. And you can, of course, you get, in, in, I mean, influenced. And, but it all, I should more, look, it should more be for, you know, you always have to check to make decisions. I want to go there. Is that right? Is that wrong? And to know um, what is right and what is wrong, you need information. You know? and, mm. and you get a lot out of yourself once you have a, a light motif. You know? mm. um, if you have a light motif, then things are easier because you, you can always look at the light motif. But then when you see like things like Arbus or Kertisch or really like decent, wonderful work, um, that teaches you, you know, of mm. course. You know? But that's very different from sitting there. I had a, I had a last week, it was in, in Palm Springs, I had a four day workshop with like 20 photographers, all established, 50 years old, 20 years old, everything mixed. And, and about this kind of, uh, the, the title was The Rule of Creativity. You know? mm. And it was very interesting. You know? And one of the points, um, was what I told them is like, you know, you, 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 if you really want to know who you are and that you have to know that, otherwise you can, you just become an insignificant guy who does pictures and nothing to do mm. with photography, you know? Mm. Then, then you have to know what is inside of you, you know? and what you stand for, your point of view, all these kind of things. And they were like, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> they were astonished about it, you know? because they were just shooting and shooting and, and whatever happened. And you say, look, some, some of them said to me, you know what I want to learn from you is how to move people with my images. A nice guy from Brazil. And, and, and I said, show me the pictures, no? And then I said to him, you want to move? Who you want to move with this? I mean, you really move me because I laugh when I see that, no? Mm. How do you want to move with the picture like this? That was kind of hard. And, and I said, when, when you want to show something, you want to say something, that's a picture of a woman, a portrait, and she had kind of a strawberry things in the head and like, I mean, ridiculous makeup. And I said, what, how can you do that then when you want to move people? And he said, that was a hairdresser. I said, oh, now we come to a good point, boys. No? Mm. You do the picture. You can't ask the hairdresser, it's not responsible. You make the picture. Only one person can do the picture. Mm. No, you decide. Do we go away from the questions now? Or no? But then, no, it's interesting what you're saying. You say, you know, you have to know who you are, but then we also talked about how the, the picture is so much about the subject. Mm. So when you look at one of your images, how much of it is you and how much of it is them? Because do you see yourself in the pictures or do you just see the other person? No, I don't want to do that to anybody. <laughs> no, it was, it's, it's, um, it's very simple because I remember days uh, in the old times. So when I had to do something, I had like an archive in my studio, all like little shells like this, and there were all kinds of, these are laughing people, running people, jumping people, and all like, like this. And then I had to do something, and I started looking at those, at those, those swipes, no? And that was so, the more you look, the less you know, no? And that's terrible. And so I could tell the boys in, the, in, in Palm Springs, I said, you don't look anywhere, no? Don't look anywhere. You get in, you get inspired by things, you see, then you forget them, and they come in your own reservoir, and you can use them after, but all is indirect, not direct, no? Mm. And, then, and then you sit down, that's what I did after, when I was, my head was totally mixed up, and the shoot was after tomorrow, I had no clue what to do anymore. You just sit down, take a piece of paper, and a glass of water, or wine, or beer, and then you sit there and think, what? 
what I want to do, what is the thing about, no? And, and then you come to original, uh, your own conclusions, and then you can, you, can, you can work from there, you can take it from there. And you have measurements, everything is like done in the same thing, because you make it and you think about it, and you, then you're sure of what you do. Mm. That's a very big difference. I'm looking at some swipes, mood boards call it today. Mm. No, I think you should, you should shoot the mood board people who come in, because what is an insult is to come with a mood board to a photographer. Mm. And it's never a mood board, you know, because my experience with mood boards, I mean, sometimes you're really happy because you don't have a concrete idea. <laughs> so, but then that helps you a little bit, you know, but that should not be like this. Mm. And the mood boards, then it's just mood boards, just for the feeling that somebody tells you. And then when the makeup and everything is ready or the no makeup is ready, then the same person comes to you with a pile and says, so which one do you want to start with, no? Mm. You, get, you get what that means? Yeah, it's like ridiculous, no? So you're being asked to So copy. what you do is like just straightforward copying other pictures, no? Mm. And then when you shoot the picture, say, oh, see, if she had this arm higher, it's so nicer. <laughs> so you really, in the worst way, you're copying other pictures. That's so ridiculous. Does it bother you when people copy your work? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel it makes me feel influential. I'm really, really happy about it. <laughs> and talk to me a little bit. I want to talk about the the Vogue cover you did with Anna Winter, her first cover. Which one? The Vogue the, the Vogue cover with Anna Winter, the first one. Because talk to me a little bit. Because that was a turning point, not just for you, but for fashion photography, for American Vogue, and you, it was kind of Avedon's. That, after that 15 title. years of Avalon, that was yeah. very embarrassing, no? That was embarrassing for me. And um, there's a story, I, no, I should not tell the story. But, I mean, that was funny because nobody talked cover so much. Anna said, you know, we, we, we're going to take a cover from the story. And we were shooting on Place La Concorde with Nikon, no tripod, no? I mean, little camera. And, and it was very fresh and easy. And I was thinking there was a, a top, See, La Croix, I re remember the fashion, with like a big cross mm. with stones, very sophisticated, it was haute couture, you know, and a little bit of stomach. And then I said, leave your pants on, leave your pants on. Uh, I, um, we cropped that anyway, because the magazine is shorter than the formula of the negative. No? And at the end, what happened was I had to leave space, so when they crop, mm. it's still like here, not here. No? And, um, and Anna was brave enough to put that on the cover because she loved the idea with the jeans. And today, like, I don't know, like 25 years later, or some 30 years later, it's a big thing. The first jeans on the cover of Vogue. I mean, is that so interesting? But and I mean, she's that laughing, was like she's not even looking at the camera, like it's such a. Yeah, everything that you should not do for cover, what it was before. She just cut off. She really wanted to make a point, no? and she did. Mm -hmm. And and that was shocking. No? That cover was shocking. Mm. And that shows the courage she had. Huh? That was amazing to do that. And then she left the jeans on there. She didn't crop that much. She just mm -hmm. left it on to, to see. And couture and jeans, and that was her program. No, um, amazing. No, I mean. And Avedon wasn't very happy, I presume. He sent me flower at one point. <laughs> I got some flowers, tulips, beautiful tulips. Did you ever speak to him about the cover? When I never talked with him. No. Never met him. That's interesting. Didn't he do his own version of the cover? He? Yeah. How do you know that? You That's what I wanted to say, but then I said, why should I say something? So <laughs> Nobody knows that. You told me last time I saw you. I? Yeah. God, then I can tell you not again because. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, don't worry. Um, so, talk to me a little bit more about the changing in the industry because one thing that must be difficult now, I suppose, is is less time and less flexibility to have these long relationships with designers because you have, you know, you talked about meeting Ray Kawakubo and being able to shape a designer's aesthetic in some way. Same with. As in Lai or someone like that, and I imagine it's harder to have those collaborative relationships now than it once was. 
Yeah, for several reasons, because um, most of the brands are not the designer owns them anymore. Yeah. So that was one of the points, I think. And then, I don't know, maybe it has become a little bit more impersonal than it was before. I was, I remember, I remember uh, uh, Giorgio, I mean, Armani was like a young guy with a little thing to start, no? That's amazing. And one of my first jobs was um, for Stern magazine when I was in Paris. And they sent me to Milan and, and to Paris and especially about Milan. And I shot all Giorgio and Gianni, all, this, all the people in the beginning. And they were just young guys who started mm -hmm. the business. I mean, amazing, no? And, and, and when you see what it has become, then you can see that whole thing has become mm -hmm. so big. Fashion is such a big thing. Mm. So it's a different industry to what you started in. I yeah, very, yeah. And, and when you say the word industry, nobody has that feeling of industry. Mm. So today you can say that without getting a, a freeze, no? But at this time, there was no industry, no? Mm. And do you, do you feel a lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that's written about you talks about how you sort of um, questioned and challenged the established version of beauty that the fashion industry put forward and do you feel like you did that and do you feel proud to have done that is it important to you to question the way that fashion depicts women but well, absolutely absolutely i think yes you have a responsibility you know, a photographer normally i mean, should if he thinks a little bit he should have a responsibility for what he's doing you know? mm -hmm. his stuff get like glued on all the walls and the billboards and wherever the magazine so he should know what what he's doing, no? Mm -hmm. And when we say when you say beautiful or beauty is the courage to be yourself, mm -hmm. that's a very clear statement and that's a very clear way to follow. No? You mm -hmm. cannot then do um, I mean, I don't even know what to say, but you do like something totally weird and crazy mm -hmm. and talk about beauty. I mean that is interesting maybe, no? But I think beauty when you talk about beauty should really have a relation to um, that should be related to something real. No? When you make like um, mm, a crazy story um, with like green lips and everything, that's fine too. No? Mm. And it's beautiful and funny. But if you talk about beauty, that's normally from for me. It's, there's only one way, no? and that is the minimum. And the courage to be yourself is not much. No, mm. I mean if you have it, it's very good and probably difficult to get. But it's not expensive, no? Mm. It's not expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because a lot of the themes that are very current in fashion at the moment, so particularly like androgyny and questioning gender, well, it, you've explored those things for a long time. And does that relate back to that idea of you have of being true to yourself? Because, you know, you've done a lot of pictures that explore androgyny. Yeah. I just like it, no? I mean, it comes, probably comes from Marlon Dietrich and the Blue Angel or something. I don't know, really. Um, but I like that idea. I like that idea. I like women in, in men's costume or something. Mm. But do you think that pictures can open people's minds? Do you think that they can have a effect in questioning how people think? And, you know, like, like when you did the Tiffany's shot of the same-sex couple or... You know, those pictures that you've done that have been sort of moments, do you believe that they can play a role in questioning people's opinions and their prejudices? No. It's optimistic. Is it hard? <laughs> no. No. I don't I don't I don't I don't think I mean if you like if you like you have a problem with your sex orientation, uh, it's not because you have seen a picture, I think. Mm. It could be, but I hope not. So why take the why take those pictures then? Well, it's not to change the world. I mean, it's because you you express something you feel to express, no? Mm. So do you take pictures for yourself mainly, or do no. you take? A very good point in the class. There was so, so so everybody was saying, yeah, in my private work, I I'm really fabulous, but you know the other work, and I said, see if you do that, you know? and that was a, a, was a, a, a thoughtful decision a long time ago. I said, I don't do pictures for myself because every picture is for myself. No? Mm. And I said, and you guys, when I see what you're doing, 
you're happy or you don't care because of your commercial work, because that commercial work does is nothing for you. But that mm -hmm. is stupid, no? Because the commercial work is still work. And mm -hmm. in 100 years, nobody asked they were commercial or not commercial. Mm -hmm. So, and, and if, you, if you don't go, they don't go out of the way from this fight, not to fight the thing that every picture you do is your picture, no? Mm -hmm. And um, that is very difficult if you separate yourself in this is what I do for money and mm -hmm. this is what I do for because I'm a genius. Mm -hmm. So I think it's much better and there was a really decision I made a long time ago that is the same thing as one mm -hmm. thing, no? And, I, and it's so funny when, when I, I one time, my first time I worked with Brad Pitt and he said, wow, is this your cameras? Are this your cameras? Just a small 35 millimeters. He said, my God, how ridiculous. You should see me and my friend. We go in the, in the forest on the weekends. We have four metal cases and do pictures, do our personal artwork there. No? I mean, that is, no, it's not about that. I think it's great. It's like one, you're like one person with one, 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 one orientation or one, mm. one thing to say. You know? And so it's sometimes in your advertising and it's not really going very far. But you can always change something. You always learn something. And if it's to defend yourself, and nobody sees a difference, and it's still like a dreadful picture, but you have pushed it a little bit, no? and then you have learned to, to do that. No? And if you mm -hmm. do the separation, then the half of your life, or three quarters, you work without thinking, without taking a position, mm -hmm. without anything like that. No? You said dreadful picture. Have there been photographs of yours that have been published that you think are dreadful? Me? No, never. <laughs> Do I my, my nose getting a bit long? Wait a second, push it back. <laughs> but really, if you like the picture, does it matter to you if anyone else does? Oh, that's a good point. Um, no, no, not at all. I don't listen if you say it's wonderful, how great, it's so fantastic. I don't listen to that one. And if you say, what is that horrible picture? I don't listen either, but I knew it either anyway, or you can, you can say what you want, it wouldn't interest me, not mm. very much, I think. Is there anyone whose opinion does matter to you? The clients, sometimes. If you don't advertise it up, and the clients say, that is a dreadful shot, man, I know I don't get paid, so better I <laughs> make a little effort. <laughs> but what keeps you motivated? Uh, Are you ever worried you'll just get bored of it all? See, everything, because if you, know, if you, like, if you work in the fashion or in around the fashion, and, and you don't go to fashion shows, you don't go to the fashion parties, uh, um, but then you live in a different world and you see different things. And that's one of the reasons why at one point I said, I don't want to see all this. It fills up like 80% of my head. So, and I become just like everybody, you know? And, and you have to find that thing for you. you know? That's as important. So what, what makes you happy? What is that thing? What makes you? me happy? Easy, I'm easy. Doesn't need much. The biggest car, the nicest penthouse, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the house and the Colosseum, of course, <laughs> and one in the mountain in Gestadt. Yeah, and sometimes, I mean, private jet, but that's too much work. <laughs> so then I'm fine, you know, easy. <laughs> you know, they said something very funny. There was, uh, WWW, the magazine, or W... WWD? Yeah, yeah. And they wrote about the business photographers, no? And there was one, they said, he's a pain in the ass, and uh, he's only talking about private planes, this kind of thing. And then there's the Lindberger. He is a really, you get every, for every dollar you pay, you get something. You get everything from him, and it's really great. And a nice guy, see, you know, no? <laughs> and, um, and that was so funny. And he said, and you just give him the biggest room in the hotel and he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally true. It's totally true. <laughs> so you're quite easy to please then? Yeah, yeah. I forgot <laughs> the house in Ibiza, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and did talk to me, one thing that I'm interested by is that you have these kind of obsessions that become these projects, so especially some of the films that you've done, I find really fascinating, so like the Models film or Pina Bausch, things like that, and where does that, that sort of desire to produce something like that come from? See, that is because it's not so orientated to fashion, so mm. you see much larger, you see things you would not see if you're in that collection 
uh, freeway, no? Mm. And that is kind of beautiful, though. So you just see something, or you hear somebody say something, and that you can take that and, and make something out of it, no? Mm. Mm. So it's much, in, it's, inspiration is everything. Everything is inspiration, no? Mm. Mm. And do you ever wish that you'd worked more in a documentary field rather than in the context of fashion? No, they pay much less, no? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, it's like, it's very, it's, documentary is very nice. I did a few documentaries. My son went to the Strasberg School in Los Angeles, who works after the Strasberg uh, um, system. Very painful. And I picked him up one time I was in LA. He was like a few months there. And I saw everybody screaming and, and crying and throwing themselves on the floor. And I said, wow, that's interesting. So that is amazing. And I asked him to ask his teacher uh, if I could do a film there, no? mm. I mean, a documentary, no? and we did. No? And it was very, very, I mean, amazing what I saw there. No? Mm. All these people, they torturing themselves, no? mm. and that's beautiful, that mm. was beautiful. And I'm interested, like you talked before, like kind of like you make the images for yourself, like, you know, if you're happy with them, you're, that's all you need, but we also spoke before about your images being political, and I do get the sense there is an idea to question something with the pictures that you take. You want to draw people's attention to something or, or yeah. change their beliefs in some way. Yeah, yeah. I think um, every story is like a statement for something, no? and um, either it is a social thing, like Pirelli thing is like a social thing, like the supermodel's beginning was this, 88 was a, so mm. a social thing. But then it can also be statement for photography. No? I did the Italian Vogue, the last issue I did with Franca, and that was uh, October, the whole issue from Italian Vogue on October. And I wanted to do, my dream was always to do a full magazine and not one story, no? not to cut it in four stories or five mm. stories. So the one story, the 100 pages. No? And, and, and that, I was an obsession to do that. No? And, and then I did the story in New York, and we had like three days, seven different models every day. They were like, everybody was more or less in there, everybody had worked with. And they were just walking on the street, and the theory called walking. And that was, that was so photographic and really boring, like the walking pictures, fashion pictures on the street. But that was all about photography. No? And mm -hmm. that is another point which is very interesting, and nobody talks about the fashion photography, it's the photography. You know? mm -hmm. Everyone talks about the fashion, but not about the photography. Mm -hmm. And the photography can, you can also, that is something you can change. No? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can change photography. If you do, if the photography is interesting, you move photography mm -hmm. forward. No? And that is interesting. That's, for example, more interesting than fashion. Yeah, that is interesting, because often when people write about your work, they talk about how you've changed fashion, but they focus less on how you've changed photography. Yeah, well, it didn't change fashion at all. That's what people say. No, I don't think so. You don't think you slightly changed? I think you ushered in a new, a new mood. Yeah, yeah, but I, I thought I thought you mean fashion, fashion. Mm. I never cut a, a skirt shorter or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me a little bit because it's interesting. I, I used the word timeless before, but another word that comes up is real. People always talk about like, you know, capturing real moments and what have you, like the girls on the beach and they're laughing and it's almost accidental. But there is this other almost opposite side to where you, you also have this real interest in sort of like high narrative and storytelling and these quite complex, like, you know, she's an alien or she's on a space. It's very different to that. And I was interested the word real comes up so much because I wouldn't necessarily say that that's always what you do. And, yeah, but it's two, it's two, that's different things, no? because that, I, I was always really, really afraid from the beginning on to get stuck mm. with the one thing I was doing. So, and, I, I, and, and that also came from when I looked at the archive I had, all, this, all these swipes, no? and you figure out the more you look, the less you know, and it's like, God, that feels terrible when you don't know. You have something to do in a week, and you have no idea what that could be. That's really terrible, no? Mm. Stressful, no? And um, these days that's not happening, no? Because you always know just there, no? 
Mm. And that's a good feeling. And then I was thinking the one thing that happens much, it's much easier to get in trouble was like several ones. So then I had that beach thing came in my mind because the beach is very comfortable because everybody looks more beautiful on the beach no? <laughs> than inside. And it's like empty in the back. You don't, and if you're in the city or somewhere, you turn the camera around and you have a problem because there's something in the background that says not what you wanted to say. So then you turn around there, the camera around there. On the beach, just that's what you want and what you're interested in. It's the person in front of you mm -hmm. and it's a nice wind and it's everything. And that's really beautiful. And so that was the one thing. So, and then I was still on the factory trip. No, every factory was like, wow, it's beautiful. No, and um, so that was another one. And then there was the studio thing, the background, the backdrops. And in the beginning I had like backdrops with very spots, very kind of spotted pointillistic backgrounds. And the pointillistic backgrounds, they were like, the, the, the models were standing close to the wall and I had like a circle of lights around them. No? A circle of lights, maybe 25 more, sometimes 30 tungstens. No? And that was so interesting to work like that. Mm. Because the, all these shallows, it's like dramatic, it's really beautiful. And you, you jump around, chuck this little one, this little one, and one the face, you could light the face, one face in a whole big thing. You could light the face, and that was a great, great school for lighting. Mm. And so that was another style. There were like the four, five, six things, no? and mm. they were all mine. And so I could sleep very good, no? <laughs> because I always going to go to the beach if I didn't know what to do. No? <laughs> <laughs> and then the city pictures, to really do like, hard, gritty um, photography in the streets, not like street photography. Mm, mm. But talk to me about that sense of fantasy, though, like doing something like where a girl is, yeah, like a, you've done like, you know, fairy tale type stories, like that's very different to a girl on a beach being herself. You're imposing an identity onto something. That, for example, that's another, another department if you want, no? Um, to go, I, I love to do narratives, no? Mm. Because if you do narratives, you can, the idea of the narratives I got, because if you have like Italian books, sometimes they do dreadful long stories, 40 pages, you do 40 pages without a narrative, that's going to be not so interesting. Mm. And the first narrative was the, the, uh, Helena Christensen in the desert with the Martian. The, the Martian, Martian yeah. crushed his UFO, she drives home with her Volvo, lives in the, in the trailer, and she sees him, and she goes there and he gets with his gun like he was like half out of space, <laughs> literally. And then she drives him home and you obviously can see him, he falls in love with her and then she shows him the desert, she shows him Los Angeles, Hollywood Boulevard, Santa Monica, and all the romantic story, you know? And you can go on, you can do 400 pages in a week, no? With this, no? And if you have not, nothing like that, you'll be really, as difficult after mm -hmm. like 30 pages. And then after, when I went back to American Vogue and the Anna wanted me there for the narrative because he wanted more narratives in the American Vogue again. And then that was the narrative stories were like very civilized in color, very um, pronounced because you can do narratives, just a hint of a narrative and then everybody can think what he wants. Or you can be kind of precise no? mm. and then it's less free for the people who see it, but it's, it's just different. And then I did stories like, what was the first story uh, when I get back? Um, that was um, model, was a woman, of course, <laughs> and she lives with a man and they're obviously like gallerists or something, very chic, nice house in Long Island, a borsoish hat, a dogs, those white dogs who looks like paper when the, I mean, that's kind of stuff, very chic Citroen uh, design car and the two kids and they're like impeccable, beautiful. And then um, suddenly they do a garden party and in the garden party you see her standing beside a young guy and we took the guy just for one shot. He flew in from Paris because he was like overwhelmingly beautiful, no? It's kind of really, and and so she stays really close to him and talks during the garden party. 
So, and then you see some things that she is not caring anymore. The kids are playing with the babysitter, she's on the phone, and that kind of thing, no? And then you can go on and on and on and on. And then you see her driving in the city, and it goes in the bank. And then you see her uh, in, in those lockers, where she puts like piles of bills in the big bag, of course, Louis Vuitton, no? And then, uh, and then she comes out, gets to the car, and the guy is waiting, the guy from the party is waiting there, and then they drive away. No, and um, that's a narrative, no? Mm. And it was in color, and it was beautiful. It was a good story. And do you feel, when you do those, do you feel like a film director? Do you want to make people, do you want to amuse people? Do you want to move people? No, no, I feel like Peter Lindbergh wants to do a good story. <laughs> <laughs> that feels pretty good too. <laughs> and tell me, what, if you were writing like a review of your photography, a review of your your life in photography, what would you want your contribution to be defined as? Well, you know, there are photographers that they could be really good, but they have never invented something. And then there are others that they have invented on, on their way, you can say, oh, wow, he did this, and then he did this, and then he did, did this. So if somebody says that about me, once I'm dead, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think I don't care anymore then, but if I would, then I would be happy if somebody says, oh, he changed that, nobody thought about this kind of photography like that, and the woman likes that, and that would be fine. And you feel like you have changed things? Yeah, I think so, I mean, I hope so. That's very difficult, the question like this, because of course I think I've done it, because otherwise I would try, still try to do it, but I'm trying to. Because now, for example, people say to me, God, you're 72 years old, that's terrible, you, you, you're still working? Why is that? And I said, that's why, because now, after all these years, now I know exactly how to handle the whole machine, you know? and, and including me. You know? I know what I feel, what I want to do, what I want to convey, and I, f and I know what you're going to think, and I see the things are like this, and I want to have them like this. So you, you can really move things, and, and I work much freer than before. Before I was much more, and then with a the camera, with a digital, you work 35 millimeter, you can do billboards. No? Mm -hmm. And before uh, 35 millimeters, the client said, sorry, you have to do middle format. And middle format is an elephant camera like this, going to and, and you can't do anything no? with it. And the other one goes, no? That's very, very different. And all this stuff is now there on, on your fingertips, and you can do the most complicated stories um, just like this. That's, that's beautiful. It would be stupid to stop. I mean, after you have really learned everything you could learn, and you can use it, and do interesting things. How will you know when to stop? Uh, probably like Avalon. He was working on, on the second Avalon in the West story um, when he died. And you'd be happy that way? I'm not happy to die, but I mean, however. <laughs> it's a good way to go, though. If I had a choice, yeah, if I had a choice, I would prefer not to die. <laughs> either working or neither working or not working. Because I was always thinking, before, I was thinking, once you're 60, nobody wants to work with you anymore. That would be great, but that didn't happen. And, and I had like 10 years to think about, because everything is so fast and so many things that I have absolutely no idea what is really happening. You know? Because it's so full and so much things, so many things. I only know that is what I want to do. You know? but I don't know really why, no? And, and I was thinking the last 10 years or five years, um, you stop and you sit down and you take a piece of paper and you write down what you think what happened to you or what you got from this, no? And I figured out that you can do that as good while you continue to work. That's a very good, there was very good news when I figured this out. And you still enjoy it? Yeah. I mean, people, people ask me, you, I used, do you travel so much? You, isn't it awful? And I said, yeah, I'm not flying tourist class, so that's pretty good. Yes, <laughs> not tight. <laughs> You're having a good time. I'm having a good time, an interesting time. A good time, not a good time guy, you know? I don't go to parties, I don't do this kind of stuff. Um, I'm embarrassed when you sit there and you know, everybody is like drunk and screaming and be happy. Um, yeah, and I also know exactly the next morning what everybody said, which is kind of not very 
empowering too. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm, the way this is pretty fine. <laughs> From time to time, an interview. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, thank you very much. It was great. I mean, how can you have all these questions just out of your stomach? <laughs>